give us a little room to spread out. Uh, Chief, Sheriff, thank you both for, uh, for joining us. L let me start by asking you the, the question that I, that I asked the, uh, the previous panel. Um, you obviously have to balance a lot of considerations in doing your job, public safety, equity, uh, uh, maintaining uh, uh, stability in communities. How do you define, when you, when you think about the issue of criminal justice reform, how do you define a successful criminal justice system? What are the metrics of success? What, what should the system be trying to achieve? Well, I think the easy answer is that we've got to get away from uh, crime counts, bean counting, as the only measure of success in, in criminal justice, because that's failed us. I've been in this line of work for 36 years, and it has not produced the results that we'd want to, counting beans. How many people did we arrest? How many of this? That's, that's an inaccurate measure. I think that to some extent, you've got to look and, and be engaged in the community to understand what the community wants of law enforcement, which understandably varies from community to community. I think Tucson and, and Pima County is a very unique community that has different expectations of law enforcement that you might find in other parts of the country. And so I think it's incumbent upon law enforcement leaders like Chief Magnus and myself to be out in the community and to be listening and to be more responsive to the, uh, the, the requirements of the So what, are some of, what would some of those other metrics look like in terms of being responsive to the community? What, what do people look for that is different than, say, the crime rate? Well, I think that the evidence in this crowd and, and this event today is that the focus on social justice is how can we move the ball forward? How can we make the, pl the playing field more level? How can we reduce the level of disparate incarceration in our country in my jail? There are 1,900 people in my jail this morning. That is a tremendous amount of incarceration in our community. And as the county administrator says, it has an impact on tax dollars. Those tax dollars are otherwise not spent on other pursuits. So I think that this community expects social justice, expects us to be um, a part of the community rather than an island onto ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that type of engagement is more a measure of metrics of success than bean counting. Chief, what does success look like to you? I, I think success looks like um, a community that feels that their police are legitimate, that they are treated in a way that is procedurally just, that people feel they're treated with respect and dignity, even in an enforcement situation that they are actually listened to and that they have a real say in deciding what the priorities are for public safety and law enforcement in the community. Um, I, I think that you know, a, a police agency that listens and that builds relationships is one that can, can really create a climate of public safety um, and legitimacy. So I think those are the key ingredients. You know, in terms of the safety, uh, Tucson's like a lot of cities, uh, uh, most cities across the country, where your violent crime rate, the bean counting, is much lower than it was in the 1990s, vastly lower than it was at kind of the high point in the early 1990s. But it has ticked back up, statistically here as in many places uh, over the last year or so. As best you can tell, is something real changing uh, or is it too early to tell? Is there, do you feel as though there is actually an uptick uh, in crime? I, th I think that the, the Bean County would tell us there is, um, but you need the long enough horizon to try to determine what the variables in society are that may be prompting that mm -hmm. uh, apparent escalation and whether that's a sustained thing or a blimp on the, on the map. We're hoping it's a blimp on the map. As, as you pointed out, the recovery here in Tucson, the economic recovery has not been as robust as it has been in other parts of the country. Um, our education system is not appropriately funded. So there are a lot of things. I think one time when we look at law enforcement or criminal justice system, it's not an island. It's, it's not an mm -hmm. island that is unaffected by other variables in society, whether that be employment, uh, education, equality, other things impact uh, those crime counts. And to look at law enforcement or criminal justice as it exists on an island, un unaffected by those other variables is a mistake. So we need to look at a, at a larger uh, picture. Chief, what do, you, what do you say about what's happening here? No, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think um, part of the challenge is that for too long we have looked at policing or law enforcement as sort of an entity in its own right, unaffected by these other dynamics. And we have to do better with that because there's no question that you know how we engage folks who have mental illness in our community is mm -hmm. significant challenge. Um, how we deal with addiction, homelessness, all of these are contributing factors to public safety in a community, and yet none of these are things that law enforcement can do 
on their own. They really have to involve um, partnerships, meaningful, meaningful collaborations that go further than just talk. And, and that's where I think we have made a lot of progress in, in this county and in this community because people really are working together um, in I think some very innova inno innovative ways. But, but I do worry that we are in a climate where there is a broader sense of fear among a large portion of our population, mm -hmm. particularly persons of color. Um, we have a, a large, I think, undocumented community in, in Tucson and in this area, and I worry that a climate of fear about reporting crime, about being a witness to crime, about working with the police from the standpoint of prevention, these things will be affected by this larger sort of narrative that's going on that I think is not, not constructive or Let's positive. Let's bookmark the mental health issue and the undocumented issue and come back to them both in a moment. But I'm struck in the way you're, you've talked about this. Uh, you know, the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, has basically argued that reform and safety are in tension and made the case that one of the reasons why many cities have seen an uptick in violent crime is because they are too focused on changing the way police departments uh, and sheriffs interact, particularly with minority communities. Do you view those goals as incompatible or complementary? No, I think that's a false statement. Um, if you looked at crime as a public health problem, how would you attack it? Would you only seek to fix the sick people or would you try mm. to prevent the illness? And that's where we really miss the, the boat in law enforcement is we're not in the criminal justice system. If we were approaching it as we have cancer, well, we know that there's been a great outreach to keep people from getting cancer mm -hmm. and then to do better interventions before the cancer becomes stage four melanomas. You can't treat the patient anymore. Unfortunately, the criminal justice system has been thrust into the point of having to treat the very, very ill patients. And then we decry the fact that we have hospitals, which would be in this mm -hmm. case analogous to jails. Um, what we need to do is to fix the, the public health problem, is to do better intervention at the front end so we don't have the very ill patients at the back end. And we don't do that. And I think that requires a synergistic approach between education, um, employment, equality. As long as there's social and racial economic inequalities in this country, there will be people that act out in criminogenic ways out of social strain. And anybody that thinks there's a level playing field in this country is simply being disingenuous. We've, we're not there yet. We've not spiked the ball and done our victory dance on equality in this country. And as long as there's inequality and disparities in our education system, disparities in employment, disparities in the manner in which we reintegrate people into society post-incarceration, we're not going to fix this problem. So if we looked at this as a public health problem, how would we approach it differently? And I think we'd approach it fundamentally different. Well, one of the ways uh, you are trying to approach it differently literally is around a public health problem where you have, as we talked about before, 60% of the people in the jail have some kind of mental health issue. I think both of you, Chief, have, have tried to change the way your departments interact with the mental health system. Can you talk about a little bit about what you're doing and wh where you're seeing success and wh what's toughest? Yeah, so for us in Tucson, and I'm sure the numbers aren't remarkably different in Pima County as a whole, about one in seven of our calls involves somebody in a mental health or emotional crisis. And that means, um, you know, we really have to have police officers trained um, and ready to deal with that as a first responder. We can't be the only responder, that's for sure, but we have to be a good first responder. And in that respect, the medical model really is helpful because it's almost the first step has to be do no harm. And for a very long time, police interactions with the mentally ill um, throughout this country have been based on, frankly, uh, and, and, and as a result of really not, knowing uh, ignorance in many cases or poor training has resulted in harm as the first level of encounter. And so what we've done here is, uh, you know, in, in, at Tucson PD, we've developed sort of a tiered approach to um, working with folks who are mentally ill. It starts with the idea that everybody in the department needs to be trained in what we call mental health first aid, which is kind of that primer, an eight-hour training session on doing no mm -hmm. harm and an understanding how to recognize when you are dealing with someone in crisis. It goes on from there, though. Um, both our departments have um, crisis intervention team 
trained folks. They go through a 40-hour program that involves understanding um, the do's and don'ts of working with someone in crisis, as well as the resources that are available out in the community. Um, and then we have another level of this, again, um, very similar model in both our agencies that at, at TPD we call it our MIST team, our Mental Health Investigated Services team. And these are a group of detectives. It's roughly, at this point, we're up to about 13 or 14 uh, folks who are part of this team who they serve um, the commitment orders when someone, when there's a signed order from a judge to take someone in for evaluation mm. for mental health reasons, um, potentially individuals who are a danger to themselves or others. And in the past, and frankly still around the country, in many departments, these kind of commitment orders are handled by just line level officers who, when they're going to a scene, they're in uniform, you know, they're, they're not necessarily trained on how to engage with someone. And so often those turn into confrontations, sometimes very dangerous events. Yeah. That's not the case here. Um, our MIST team detectives are in plain clothes on marked vehicle. They have extensive training. They know a lot of these individuals by name. They've worked with their families. They've worked with their treatment providers. And their track record on getting folks to come voluntarily is incredible. I mean, the use of force is almost zero. So now we're taking it even one step further where we're teaming up um, these MIST team individuals uh, are detectives with clinicians. They go out together to work with folks proactively. And their duties go beyond just the Title 36 commitments. They're also, um, when our officers, for example, are dealing with someone out in the community repeatedly who looks like they're a high risk to themselves or to others or who's threatening, maybe someone who's creating a regular problem in a business downtown, they, they go and have a proactive interaction with them to figure out what's going on. Mm. Do we need, how can we help you get back into treatment or to start treatment? How do we connect you to resources? You know, in the previous panel, I mentioned that in many uh, communities, you hear that the, you hear law enforcement saying that the jail has become the mental health provider of last resort. And someone amended that to say that they feel like here it's often the mental health provider of first Resort. Do you feel that way? Well, I, it, to some degree I do, but I think that would undercut the good efforts of our community-based uh -huh. partners. We do have a lot of community-based resources here in Pima County, and I'm, I'm very grateful of that. I've seen that evolution in, in my career life of having more community-based alternatives. We didn't used to have these. And you feel you have more now? I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. There's still work to be done there, and I think we need to decriminalize the idea that being mentally ill is a crime. Um, being abu uh, addicted to narcotics is, is a crime. If you again go back to this public health perspective, you would view these things differently. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at the Pima County Jail is we realize that when we incarcerate somebody that has acute mental illness, we're able to stabilize that person in the correctional environment because they get on medication, um, they're in a structured environment. But what used to happen is we'd open the door and say, good luck. Mm. Um, and they would go back into the community. We'd be surprised if they would reoffend. So now what we do is we provide that person seven days of bridge medication. Well, that seems like a very common sense approach, doesn't it? A very common sense approach that has a very low cost point to the people of Pima County, but that allows a person to continue to be stabilized in the community until they can get to one of our community-based alternatives. Um, let, me, let me move to another area. Uh, you are literally on the front line of the debate on the, over the border and immigration and drugs and all of the related issues. I want to uh, explore this from several different angles, but let me start by asking you, Chief, does that create any unique public safety challenges for you? Are you facing specific public ch uh, safety challenges linked to what is happening uh, at the border? I think it does create some public safety challenges. The last panel, there was some discussion about the amount of meth and opioids, heroin, that um, I think really does come into this community in a pretty significant amount. And so dealing with that is a challenge, both from an enforcement and from an addiction and, and treatment standpoint. But I think um, the other real issue is that, you know, we are, we are trying to be responsive as law enforcement officials to 
the political world around us. And we're in a community that, you know, so we can't be a sanctuary city per se mm -hmm. under Arizona law. Um, and, and I'm not even sure what that actually means uh -huh. because in most, most cities, even sanctuary cities, frankly, there is a level of cooperation between police and sheriff's departments around individuals who are dangerous or violent regardless of what their documentation status is. Nobody right. wants those right. folks in the community. But what we're still left with then is a large segment of our community that really is fearful about dealing with the police. And so that means I think we have to go the extra mile in terms of reaching out to that community, making it clear we are not the immigration police. That is not our mission. We have neither the resources nor the desire to do that. We want to work with victims of crime regardless of what their document sta documentation is. So let me follow is. up by asking you first and the, and the sheriff, what is the proper level of interaction, cooperation uh, that you have determined between SB 1070 and federal law? What do you think it is appropriate for your officers to do with ICE and what is too far? Well, I actually think the model that um, was put in place uh, under the prior administration is closer to where we should be, ideally, mm -hmm. which is this priority enforcement program that recognizes that there are dangerous and violent individuals, there is gang activity, there is drug trade, there is human trafficking. That These are the kind of activities where it is appropriate to work with our uh, Homeland Security, with ICE, with Border Patrol. I don't I don't think most members of our community, regardless of what their status or their background is, would, would disagree with that. I think taking it further, um, moving local police into, for example, a 287G type mm. program that essentially deputizes them to be uh, immigration officials, I, I think that's a massive mistake. I think it's, it undercuts uh, trust in the police. It is, especially in a community like ours, I mean, this is really a low income community. They're not a lot of resources for policing, treatment, other programs. Mm -hmm. And so to take those limited resources and to say suddenly we're going to be extension of um, immigration enforcement, I think that's a serious Sheriff, what's the, what's the what's the line? Well, I, I think that we need to be, and I think the public safety is benefited by my department being cooperative with our federal partners without adopting federal responsibilities. Um, I have, my county is 9,200 square miles. I have about 500 sworn officers to patrol that area. I don't have the resources, nor do I have the inclination to adopt federal immigration responsibilities. Immigrants are not our enemy. Mm. Mexico is not our enemy. Um, and we need to be honest about that. Uh, what is, as Chief Magnus, my friend, points out, is, is what is the enemy of public safety are transnational crime organizations, drug trafficking organizations, um, human trafficking organizations, and then we don't know about national security threats because our border is porous. We need to have a responsible and thoughtful dialogue about immigration in this country, and we need to divest local law enforcement from a discussion about immigration to a discussion about crime without respect to where it comes from. So for people who are in the jail, and ICE wants you to detain them, ICE detainers. You have said that is what, like, like a cocktail napkin, right? I mean, that it, no legal authority. What do you do and what won't you do? We will not detain somebody um, based on an ICE detainer. It provides me no constitutional basis uh, for extending detention of anybody. Um, that being said, there is a window in which if um, you, we knew you had an ICE detainer on, we know you're going to re be released, we would notify our federal partner, we're about to release Ron, he'll be released in about an hour and a half to two hours. If you still want Ron for a legitimate criminal justice purpose based on that ICE detainer, you're welcome to come and we will transfer custody. If they don't get there in that period of time, you're on your own. We will not detain you one minute past that. You know, you mentioned all of the, the genuine threats that you see, uh, transnational uh, drug traffic, human traffic, uh, crime organizations. These are exactly the reasons the president says that there needs to be a wall no, on the border. He, he's, he's saying he wants a wall because he's afraid of illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. Let's be real about this. This is not about public safety. What would the, uh, wall, what would the wall mean? I, I think the wall <laughs> is a medieval solution to a modern problem. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, that being said, I, I, I think that we understand that we do need border security. 
And the thing that we don't talk about, and it frustrates the, the Dickens out of me, is the human rights tragedy. Uh, my, my deputies recover about 150 bodies a year in the deserts of Pima County. This is a human rights tragedy. Many of these people will never, will never know who they were. We'll never know where they are victims of the environment, bandits, coyotes. We know the level of victimization of people traversing the deserts of Pima County to come here for a better life. And I would challenge my conservative friends, and I've, I've done this in public settings, if your family were impoverished, if your family were in danger, if your family were desperate, what would you do? And they'd say, I would do anything. Okay, would you walk across the desert 60 miles in the heat to protect your family to provide them a better existence? Of course I would, okay? Um, and a lot of these people will never know. My, my deputies recovered a skull um, out by Ajo this past week. We'll never know who that skull belonged to or what happened to that person. In, in all likelihood, that person was probably not of Mexican descent. It was Guatemalan, Honduras, Ooh. El Salvador, and that person's family will never know what befell that person. This is human rights tragedy. We need to talk about that, and we're not, that's not even part of our Bringing family. Bringing the audience in. But Chief, let me ask you on, a, on another. Um, you have been an advocate everywhere you've been of community policing, and there was a big push to encourage more community policing, particularly in the 90s. As you have tried to implement that here, what are the obstacles, what are the, uh, what are the benefits, the rewards? Well, I think, I think my, my concern is that Community policing also almost becomes a ubiquitous term that means mm -hmm. sort of everything or nothing. You know, it really, right. it, it, you have to, if you're going to do real community policing, you have to create an environment in which officers have the time and the resources to build relationships on a geographic basis within neighborhoods. And you have to support that effort. Officers have to be specifically trained in really human interaction skills that go beyond technical kinds of problem solving that police are called on. And especially in this day and age, you know, with young people who are coming out of the academy that are better texters than talkers sometimes, mm. you know, we have, to, we have to retrain people on how to actually engage with each other and give them those skills and, get, and then give them, you know, if community policing is really important to a department, then you have to ask, are people being evaluated in that area? Are they being promoted or given special assignments based on how well they engage along those lines? A lot of departments talk a good game about community mm -hmm. policing, but it's back to what the sheriff mentioned earlier, which is what they really count are you know, the number of you know, arrests or very typical measures of police. And, and I was thinking that as both of you were talking before, which is whether it's by voters or elected officials who decide, you know, uh, who to hire, are you being judged and measured by equity and the strength of relationships with communities? Or are you being judged by the crime rate? Well, that's difficult. I think you always be judged a little bit by the crime rate. Obviously, if homicides were up by 100%, the community would rightly judge us. Uh, based on that, but I'd like my department to be judged better on how we do our normal day-to-day -day activities. Huh. How do we better reach out to people? And you talked about community policing. Community policing has got to stop being a term. It's got to stop being a project. It's got to start being a condition. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a condition mm -hmm. that permeates everything that law enforcement agency does. And it doesn't have to be a special bike patrol. It, it's a matter of how people pick up the phone and records when you need a re police report. It's how an officer takes a burglar report. It's got to be a condition that permeates how you see yourselves and how you see yourselves engaged in the community. And, and, you know, community policing as a term has been around my entire career and it's really struggled to define itself. And I don't think we're there yet. I really don't. All right, let's bring in the audience. There are microphones somewhere, I think. Uh, we have a question right here in the middle. Microphones are descending. I'm Rachel from the Southwest Fair Housing Council. I'm really concerned about the conversations we've been having this entire time because we're sitting under this panel that's called Race and Justice, and most of the conversations we've been having, especially with this panel, are related to mental health. So it's like we're pathologizing kind of the way the people that go through our system instead of recognizing that our system is inherently racist and that we do have much more cops down in Southside in the areas of town that are, that are populated by people of color than we do in the foothills. So um, I don't know how you address that, what that means with community policing, um, with all those conversations that we've been having, but I think it's really important to recognize that the, the systems are racist. What are the systems going to do to no longer be racist? Talk about... Well, well, so just to answer your first question, 
Tucson actually doesn't, the city of Tucson does not include the foothills. So I can only cover the section that is the city of Tucson. But, but what, what I do strive to do is place officers throughout the community based on, on need, on calls for service, on ongoing crime patterns, and it's not based on any sort of racial demographic. That said, that said, I don't disagree that we really have to deal with the issue of race and policing, which means, again, it has to come back to training, it has to come back to supervision. We've done unconscious bias training with our officers. We've done training related to procedural justice. We do ongoing um, training that involves putting officers in scenarios where we have real community members participating in those scenarios and giving them situations to deal with. We're looking at trying to get more complete input from the community that reaches into areas that have historically not had good relationships with the police. So uh, look, we have to get beyond coffee with a cop that just involves the friendly folks that love seeing the police in the neighborhood. We have to look at how do we engage with young people, particularly of color, who are deeply suspicious of law enforcement, and try to figure out how do we build bridges there? How do we start conversations? And then ultimately, I think one of the measures of success is how do we recruit from those different neighborhoods and communities into our departments where people are actually serving the neighborhoods that they came from. So I, I get it. These are complex problems, but we do recognize that they exist, and I think we're trying to deal with them. I, I would agree that we have a lot of work to do. Um, there's no question, and, and Chief Magnus brought up the ability to recruit people into our profession out of minority communities is to some degree stymied by very antiquated uh, rules that allow who can be uh, uh, certified by post. But I will share with you a story. Last night after I left our event, um, I was driving up uh, Flowing Wells, and um, there was a motorcyclist laying in the roadway had just been uh, in a crash. When I jumped out of my vehicle and I ran in front of traffic literally to stop mm. him from being run over, I had no idea of the race of that person. I, I did not know. Um, that didn't enter into my calculus of whether or not I would risk being run over myself to stop somebody from being run over. I realize racism exists. To deny that would be uh, disingenuous. Um, but I don't think it is as systemic in the, in the hearts of uh, law enforcement officers as you might think. Um, I don't think it is a systemic uh, thing that we adopt, um, and I, I would re I reject it on that premise. The, the argument, though, that you do here is that this, regardless of the individual, you know, motivation of, of any individual officer, is that the sheer intensity of policing in minority communities produces uh, uh, kind of a, a level of surveillance that results in more uh, uh, arrests and, 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 and accusations than you would see in other places. On the other hand, sometimes you're dealing with elevated crime rates. How, you said it's a complex problem. How do you balance that, and do you feel like you have an answer to that, to that question? Well, uh, the very limits of policing in, in Tucson have an influence on that dynamic, mm. regardless of what neighborhood mm. our officers are in. They can barely keep up with calls for service right now based on staffing. It's not like they have a lot of time to just drive around proactively and, and pull people over for whatever the reason might be. Mm. The struggle is to try to just meet the demands of the community to respond to calls. So, I, I mean, I think we have to keep talking about these issues. We have to make our officers aware of these dynamics. Part of it, you know, I, I continue to discover that there are a lot of officers who don't even understand the history of how race intersects with policing and why there is so much distrust. And so we have to have conversations about that that involve the community. But again, I don't yeah. think there's one simple answer Let, to this. You know, the other thing, we need to look at you know, the disparate crime rates in minority communities and look at employment. Uh, other inequalities in, in, in education, you can't tell me that the education is equal at, um, in the south side as it is in the foothills. There are socioeconomic and racial disparities that exist that we need, again, to stop looking at law enforcement in this little island and start looking at this as a system. If you wanted to fix this, you would fix the system, and we need to do it as a public health crisis and try to keep the thing from not becoming ill first. And uh, I don't think we do a very good job of, of being honest about employment, education, and uh, equality disparities in, in primary minority communities. Let's bring in one more. I'm Pat Watson, and I'm with the Southern Arizona Council for International Visitors. And I just want to take a minute and say that these two guys 
have put their officers with our international visitors to expand both our in, um, understanding of culture and and theirs of ours. And I can't I can't thank you guys yeah. enough. Thank, thank you. you. Let's let's go to the front row. We got one more here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi. Lucy Labosha, I'm a public school educator. How about a quick question? Are there initiatives in place in, in the city of Tucson where that will allow you to actively recruit people of color to work within communities that we're talking about? Yeah, and, and this is key. What we, and again, it comes back to how do we reach into some of these neighborhoods, particularly communities of color, and get young people at least a foot in the door? For example, that, that period between 18 and 21, where, where folks are really deciding who they are and what they want to be, but where they also often get into trouble, we got to be bringing people into the police department, whether it's as interns, whether it's as um, explorers, whether it's in civilian positions of various sorts like community service officer. If we can get people to make an investment at that point and start building a relationship, then we can often hire them and keep them on as police officers when they turn 21. But we can also involve them in helping to facilitate some real discussions that need to happen with young people of color in the community about the dynamics of race and policing, which has got to happen. With all due respect, that's in theory? No, it's not. <laughs> Yeah, these are real programs. It's not, it's not theory. These are things we're actively yeah. working on now. And part of the challenge is figuring out how do we get the word out on this and get more community members involved in helping us accomplish this? Because we can't do it ourselves. The programs are for real. The, the other thing that we need to do is to, um, to look at the requirements to become a certified peace officer in our state. They're antiquated, and they have a disparate impact on minority applicants. Yeah. Uh, whether it be minor drug use, minor crime in, that happened in the past, disqualifies people and has a disparate impact on minority applicants. And, and I am addressing that with Arizona Post. Are those set at the state level? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we're going to hear in a moment from the other side of the equation from a number of community leaders about the, from, uh, their perspective and interactions with law enforcement from that, uh, from that direction. Would you join me, though, now in, in uh, thanking Chief Magnus and Sheriff Napier? Thank you.